Hello, I'm Emma Louise Coffey and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. In part two of our conversation with Jerk Cusack from Cumra Vets and FRS manager Ned Dunphy, they document the most common lameness conditions that arise in grazing dairy systems and provide recommendations for appropriate treatment strategies. I first asked Jer to identify factors that predispose cows to lameness. The first thing I would would say is getting getting your foot from or vet onto the farm and assess what the level of lameness is there. Treat any uh, initial cows that are, are lame, uh, get that under control. And then I would continue on um, using probably uh, good management skills, maybe to help, you know, reduce the level of lameness going forward. Like number one, like I said, uh, foot bedding is very important, uh, probably a better management. And then, of course, you need to learn maybe a little bit about mobility scoring, picking out cows that may go lame over the next couple of weeks and having a, a kind of a standing arrangement, like Joe was saying, with your local foot trimmer that he can come along onto the farm and, um, you know, uh, you know, deal with those cows. And I, I definitely think like if if you have a good program like that in place, you can definitely uh, bring down your level of lameness to a very acceptable level, which would be, you know, a very small number of cows. Like no one is never going to have lame cows, but as long as they don't become an issue and a problem from a financial problem and a welfare problem on the farm, I think um, that's the way of what farmers should look at, at doing you have both named some of the common um, lameness conditions on farms. So we might talk through some of them to to help farmers identify, yes, this is actually what condition I'm, I'm, I'm looking at. Um, so we might start with you, Jer, in relation to white line disease. Now, you've referred to it and you talk about the white line vena being a very vulnerable part of the hoof. But can you explain exactly what the white line is and then, you know, how the, I suppose, lameness occurs as a re- result of white line disease? The horn of the hoof is made up of two separate uh, sections, if you like. The uh, the, sec- the sole section, the sole, the, the, the parts in contact with the ground is horn that grows constantly at the rate of a millimetre a week directly down from the sole of the cow, directly down from the sole that's in contact with the, with, with the, with the ground that goes straight down in, 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 in straight lines from the sole. The wall then uh, grows from where the hairline ends, a, an area called the coronary band. So yeah, if you look down along your, the, the, foot, the foot of your cow, you'll see the hair stops and the hoof starts. And that's like that the, where the hair stops that's like the base of your nail uh, if you damage your nail and your nail falls off it grows from the bottom up where well, hoof wall grows from the top down it essentially operates the same as your nail so you have your you have your hoof wall growing from the top down and you have your sole growing directly out from the sole of the cow and you have a junction where the two meet around the edge of the sole and that's called the white line and that's a welded junction where the two the, the two sources of horn are fused together. The only problem is that they're not fused terribly well. And this is an area that gives rise to a lot of problems on the foot. So in the grazing animal in particular, most of the lameness that we see are white line problems where you get bits of dirt or bits of grit getting in along that welded junction and gradually working its way in along and the 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 thickness of the sole of most cows will probably be under a centimeter and it just works its way up through the through that horn and when it gets to the to the actual quick then the sensitive foot then you get an inflammatory reaction and your cow goes lame uh, the reason the white line is important is that it's the weakest part of the sole that's in contact with the ground and you're going to run into problems really anywhere on the sole in relation to penetration of the sole by by grit or dirt or small stones it's likely to happen along the white line so that's why it's significant and i suppose that's why i'm talking about it quite a bit it's uh, the most vulnerable point on the sole and probably you know maybe 60 percent of the lame 60 to 70 percent of the lame cows that we see in the grazing animals are white line problems and common treatment for it your common treatment would would, would be uh, uh, hoof trimming around the problem area 
leveling up both claws so that to ensure that both claws uh, take take an even share of the weight. And if the if there's a significant problem there, uh, possibly putting a block on the sound claw to rest the affected claw. Some of them require antibiotics, but uh, um, most don't. And I think it's very interesting when you do um, trim back a hoof where there is a white line issue, like you often find that little bit of grit or even, you know, a stone in it. Um, So, you know, the cow just needs relief and to get that uh, problem out of the hoof. Um, To you, Ned, um, you talk a lot about martillaro and can you tell us how it is occurring in the dairy cow and why you are seeing such an increase? You talked about, you know, it can be at 10 percent in a herd and the problem can build to almost, you know, two thirds of the the herd can have the problem. Right, right, Emma. um, Like, I suppose if if you go back 30 years ago, there was, I suppose, little or no model in, in, in the national herd. But since about the late 80s or that, I suppose, really due to, I suppose, an, Im- an importation of animals into the country, um, the, the disease kind of um, rapidly increased. Now, it is, it, it's, a, it's a very infectious disease that generally occurs um, kind of around the skin between the, between the, the two claws on the back or in the front. And uh, it spreads in the right conditions, which is generally when the animal the animals are indoors, it spreads in slurry, it spreads in warm, moist conditions. And um, like, I suppose, over the last number of years, uh, number one, because of the increase maybe in cow numbers, uh, maybe, you know, overcrowding, maybe not a, a, enough ventilation in, in, in sheds and that, there has been a much bigger increase in, in, in the problem. And I suppose, Try and get on top of it. Number one, what a farmer needs to do is put in a very good foot bedding program, where he'll he'll uh, foot bat his cows regularly. Regularly, in other words, do them two to three times a week. Um, you know, especially when the cows are indoors, and maybe you once you get the problem under control, that you'll revert back to once a week. Now, in saying in talking about a foot bedding program, a foot bedding program is really only a control measure. If, if, if an animal has, has, has the disease, you know, and it's, it's, it's fairly active and fairly kind of raw, that animal has to be lifted and treated with, uh, with a spray or with, with a gel and bandaged. And the, that the farmer then can continue to control the problem, to stop it spreading, especially while the animals are indoor. But like, I suppose, um, I suppose Jerry often talks about uh, Martellero being kind of mastitis of the of the hoof which it really is i mean you know if if a farmer has you know from a point of view of after every milk and he tea tips his cows but i mean a farmer should actually have the same frame of mind where martellaro is concerned because it is a problem that will spread easily in the herd if it's not controlled and i think regular foot bathing like you know needs to be done where there is an issue with, 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 with this disease. And Ned, like, what is the recommendation in terms of product used and rates of product to water in a foot bath where um, you're treating animals? You talk about once a week where the, you know, you have good control and where there's a significant problem, you're going two to three times well, a I week. I suppose there's a, there's a number of different products on, on the market. And I suppose using that product, it's very important any product you use uh, it's used at the rate that the manufacturer actually uh, <laughs> recommends. So, like you've pro- you you have you have a product from Farmland, you have Hoofshow. There, there, there is so many different pro- uh, different products available uh, at the moment there for for foot bathing. But again, it's very important if a farmer is setting up a foot bath that he sets it up number one where the animal is used to walking. Because if you try and force an animal to um, um, you know, go through a foot bath, they're going to end up making it very dirty. It won't be as number one as effective. It it will the other thing that will happen is farmers, because they find it hard to foot bed their cows, they won't they won't do it. So set up your foot bath where the animals aren't used to walking, where, where it's not becoming an issue. And you know, use whatever product that, that you can get available under the manufacturer's recommendations. 
And, you know, uh, you, you talk about, you know, if the cow isn't used to walking through it, she can dirty it and then the effectiveness of it for the whole herd is reduced. Um, you know, is, the, is there a recommendation that you'd power wash the hooves before they'd go into the foot bath? Or would you have maybe two stations? One is water only to clean off the hoof and then the second is the treatment station. Well, I'd say number one, like it would be great if, if the farmer can wash the feet, you know, as as uh, before the the the, the, the raw cows uh, leave the parlour, or even be- even before you put on the the clusters on the cows, and then the, the, the feet are nice and dry. I wouldn't really recommend uh, um, uh, a foot a water foot bath before before the the, the the foot bath with the chemical because the problem is if cows walk through water there. They're still half soiled, and they're actually bringing, I suppose, uh, you know, half dirty uh, oofs into a product. Now, I think it's, it would be much better if, if a farmer, if he, if he wants to do that, is to wash the feet, you know, before they leave the parlour. At least they're clean and they're they're fairly dry before they come they they enter the foot bath. Like I suppose the secret really, Emma, in a foot bath is putting it where the animal is used to walking, and if they if they don't mind going through it. It's not a chore for the farmer and it's not a chore for the, for the animal. And a final question on the foot bathing for you, Ned, is, um, you know, where Mortellaro isn't a problem. Um, is it a standard practice for farmers to foot bathe um, their animals, not necessarily in the treatment of it, but maybe just in the strengthening of their hooves? Well, I mean, if, if you're having the problem, I, 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 couldn't, I wouldn't see the real need. If there's no, if, if there's no Mortellaro on, on, in, in your herd, I, I don't see the real need for using a foot bath. Now, I mean, that's up to each individual farmer if he wants to foot bathe the cows, because at the end of the day, a foot bath is only a disinfectant. You disinfect the, the feet to, to prevent the spread of something like the Mottelaire disease. And back to you, Ger, um, you also mentioned um, sole bruising or sole ulcers. Again, like what is um, the cause of um, these conditions and what is the treatment? I suppose, uh, Emily Louise, if we just focus on, on, on uh, the, the grazing herd, because the majority of our cows are grazing, are, are, are grazing animals and they're, they're in the, certainly in the south of the country, they're going to be out for eight months of the year if possible. Uh, the, the biggest the biggest source of, 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 of soil bruising like would be uh, twofold. It would be uh, maybe poor walking surfaces, number one, and number two, cows uh, not being able to go at their own pace and being maybe forced forced uh, to, to, to walk in a hurried fashion or be under pressure or be, be, be pushing or shoving. And uh, when that happens, then they're not able to, to be as careful as they would normally be. Like your, your, your black and white cow is not a risk taker. And if she gets the opportunity to survey the ground and what, check the ground, uh, and gets the time to do that, she'll do that and she'll avoid most of the hazards. But uh, where where you get bruising is as a, res- as a result of she being under pressure or being pushed or shoved or rushed. She doesn't have time to avoid that, to, to, to check for the hazard and avoid the hazard. And uh, secondly, then, if you have sections of roadway that are, are, are very rough or if you have situations like where you have maybe um, mud, on concrete and stones on the concrete, and the cows can't actually see the stones because of the, be, 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 because there's there's some mud on the concrete. Um, like they're the type of situations where cows uh, actually bruise their soles, and we see lots of bruising on cows' soles, uh, soles of their feet. They don't always cause lameness, but in some cases, they're sort of the first step on the road to a cow going lame. And, and treatment of sole bruising, Ger. The treatment uh, would be some some uh, hoof pairing and uh, rest. That 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 if you had a, an animal, particularly a young animal, first or second lactation animal, had significant sole bruising, uh, you would keep her near the parlour, maybe milk her once a day. If 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 it was happened if it was happened happened outside of the non grazing time, you would put her on a straw bed, take her off the cubicles. They're the sort of treatment measures. But I, I I think the real focus around this should be around 
prevention as far as possible, uh, Emma Louise, and trying to ensure like that cows have plenty of time to walk and that they're walking on good surfaces and that the, the roadway surfaces are good and that the concrete surfaces are good. And, and the ideal would be if we could prevent as many of these arising as possible. I, I think that's an excellent point um, and it, it's it's so interesting that it has come up, um, you know, at several points during our conversation. The incidence of lameness that we are experiencing within the grazing context um, in Ireland, a lot of it is very preventable in terms of how we go about um, the daily business on a farm in terms of the human behaviour and as well as that, our own facilities, whether it's your roadways or, you know, the use of a bat latch, um, the collecting yard, um, cubicles and sheds. You know, there's there's a there's a whole lot to think about. And I'll certainly have to listen back um, to pick up on all the information that you have provided. Um, I think a really good starting point that you have um, you have mentioned, Ned, is is to get in some external help um you know a foot trimmer or a vet can can uh, identify the problem with you and start a treatment process for any cow that may be in trouble whether it's um you know beginning to have an issue with locomotion or a cow that has a significant lameness problem thank you jer and thank you ned thanks Anna louise that's it for this week's episode of the dairy edge podcast and my thanks to jer cusack and Ned Dunphy for joining me on this week's show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.